So as we jump into the word today, if you're visiting with us or this is your first time or first time in a long time, we've been on, I don't know, four or five weeks of a message series where we've been talking about different aspects of the word anointing, what it is, how it works in our life, why we have an anointing and what God wants to do. So I think today is the final of this message series, but I think God saved the best for last. So if you press in with me, it'll be a good day. Amen. Also, real quick before I jump into that, Wednesday night, we kicked off a five-week Bible series called Revival If. The lobby was packed Wednesday night with people just hungry for God. And I've had several calls this week of people just from that first study just saying, listen, it, it's, it's doing something. I can't sleep. I, I, I'm tossed. I, uh, somebody said, hey, I was in the church at 7 a.m. on my face before God because it's stirring something in the heart of God's people. And uh, so even though you missed one, uh, it's all right. Jump in this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for the next four weeks. All right. So we've been looking at the anointing and what it is, how it operates in our lives. And one of the most important things that we can have in our lives is the presence of God and his anointing. The word anoint, just to, to recap, means to smear or to rub all over. It, it, it's really the, the tangible power of God on our lives. When you have an anointing on your life, there's something different about you. There's something that people say, hey, there, there, there's just something different. I, I can't maybe put my finger on it, but they just are a little bit different and people notice. And it doesn't mean you act weird or you get super religious or you float on a a cloud. It just means that there's something different. And can I say that sometimes those differences are that you become a person of character, a person of integrity, a person of honesty, a person who keeps your word? All right, you ain't shouting me down quite yet. But... One of the other things that we said is that the anointing has with it a fragrance. The anointing has a fragrance, and the fragrance of the anointing attracts the favor of God in your life. When you have an anointing, you begin to see radical favor in your life. God begins to open doors for you that other people say, how could that happen? How could they get there? Well, it's not by me. It's by God's grace and by the anointing that he's placed on my life to empower me to do what on my own I could not do. So we learned over the last few weeks is that in one way, the anointing is a free gift from God. It comes by his grace and mercy. But we've also learned over the last few weeks is that to increase the anointing and walk in the anointing, there is a price that you and I have to pay to walk in a greater level of his anointing. Amen? Amen. So I want you to listen to 1 John 20 or 2.20. And we've been reading this scripture, but it says, you have an anointing. Everybody say, that's me. me. Come on, you wait with me. Say, that's me. me. There you go. You have an anointing from the Holy One. You have been set apart, uh, specially gifted and prepared by the Holy Spirit. And all of you know the truth because he teaches us, illuminates our minds, and guards us from error. As you, the anointing, the special gift, the preparation which you have received from him remains permanently in you, you have no need for anyone to teach you. But just as his anointing teaches you, giving you insight through the presence of the Holy Spirit about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as his anointing has taught you and must re- you must remain in him, being rooted in him and knit in him. So where I want to land this plane in our discussion over the last several weeks about the anointing is that last line. Because we say things about the anointing and, you know, we talk about the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God that's present when the anointing shows up. We talk about the favor of God coming on the anointing, and that's 100% true and accurate. And we talk about the anointing and enabling you to do things that you never thought you could do. And that's fantastic, and we 100% believe in all of that. But what I want to talk about today is these last few lines that we just read. You must remain in him being rooted in him and knit in him. Can I submit to us today that the anointing is more than shouting and goosebumps, but the anointing is also our empowerment to live holy before a righteous God. The anointing is our empowerment to not only do incredible mountain moving things and, you know, prophesy and do all of those, you know, extraordinary gifted things. It's the empowerment for us to live right. 
It's the empowerment to keep our mouth closed when we want to say something we shouldn't say. Come on. It's the empowerment to live faithful. It's the empowerment to keep your heart right. It's the empowerment to forgive. It's the empowerment to walk righteous before a holy God. So I, I, when I was praying to conclude this series, I just really felt impressed from the Lord is that I wanted us to have a correct understanding of all of the aspects of the anointing. You have an anointing. I have an anointing. But the more we're rooted in him, the greater the anointing grows and the more ability we have to overcome even those small things that sometimes can be very difficult. There's a story in your Bible of a woman who breaks an alabaster box over Jesus' feet and she breaks it and there's that imagery of the, her, her perfume filling the room where they were. And some of the significance of that is just as that jar had to be broken for that oil to be poured out, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the oil of the Holy Spirit that's in us requires that we allow our clay jar to be broken so that we can be poured out and what we have on the inside of us can be a benefit to other people. How many of you know, if whatever's in me doesn't do any good to God or to anybody else, if it's in me and can't come out of me? Come on, somebody. The vehicle that carries the anointing is my soul. That's my mind, my will, my emotions. And we don't have a spirit problem because when we are born again, our, our spirits are renewed, our spirits are saved. What we have is a soul problem. So the problem isn't that you don't have an anointing. And the problem isn't that your spirit can't carry the anointing. The problem that we have is we have a soul problem. My mind gets in the way. My will gets in the way. And my emotions get way in the way and jump from one thing to another like every 20 seconds sometimes. It's what the apostle Paul called carnality. And that word actually means carnal Christians. Carnal Christian, it means to, they follow their animal impulses. No control, no self-control, no fruit of the spirit being developed in our lives. Just doing whatever it is we feel, saying whatever it is we want to say, no control. You know, we can't control our tongue. You know, we think that there's power in the boldness to tell everybody what we just think. Come on, you have an anointing. We expect the anointing to move mountains and break yokes, but if the anointing can't control your tongue, then we've lost the point of the anointing. If the anointing can't keep you from saying that negative thing, we've lost the power of the anointing. If the anointing can't help us stay married, we've lost the power of the anointing. If the anointing can't help us be honest, we've lost the power of the anointing. All right. I knew it might get quiet in the house this morning, but that's all right. Paul put it like this. He said, you follow ordinary impulses. You follow your own thoughts, your own mind, your own will. You follow the crowd. We just do whatever it is we want to do. And every Sunday, people march into the church house, hearing the word, lifting our hands, experiencing the presence of God, but we walk out the doors and we do exactly whatever it is we want to do with the rest of our lives and expect God to bless it because we put in, you know, an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday morning. But we have an anointing and we need to learn not to do anything, not dare try to do anything outside of that anointing. I found this illustration. I've never seen it before this way, but over the last few weeks, we talked about David and how David was anointing, anointed by Samson because God had rejected Saul and, and, and you know, Saul had kind of gone off the rails. But there was something else in that story that the Lord brought out to me, and I want you to see it. Saul, at one point, was anointed to be king. And the Bible says that uh, the Spirit of God came on him and, and, you know, he rolled, but he won his own way. And it turned him really into something different. And how many of you know when the anointing comes on, you can be dramatically different than you are in the natural? Most people, you know, who are maybe new to our church, they see me and they think, oh, he, you know, he preaches, he must be an extrovert, and he must be like, you know, bouncing around everywhere. I'm really an introvert. What's funny is when the anointing comes on me, it's different. And I can't tell you how many times there's a different boldness that comes when the anointing comes on and I'm preaching and the power of God's flowing. And how many times I've jumped up in the middle of the night on Sunday night into Monday morning and was thought, oh, did I say that? 
Because in my own, I would never. Come on, somebody. But the anointing is empowerment. And that anointing had come on Saul. And Saul became king. And it was that, that gifting that enables us to do something that we can't naturally do. But I want us to know today that we're not just anointed for spiritual things. We have to be anointed to do anything in life. We better cry out to God for an anointing to be a parent. We need an anointing to be a husband or a wife. We need an anointing to operate a business. So Saul was anointed, but Saul lost his anointing. But what I want us to see is David, though he failed, though he made mistakes, David never lost his anointing. Why? Well, Saul disobeyed God. God told him to go invade the enemy territory, and he said, kill everything that's there, everything in it's supposed to be gone. And Saul just couldn't wrap his mind about all the good stuff that was there. So he decided to keep some of the good stuff for himself and get rid of the bad stuff. And uh, he tried to tell God, well, this is what I've done, and this is so cool. And he even went out, the Bible says, and, and was so proud of himself that he built a monument to himself. Got a little problem there. So God said, listen, I regret that I ever even made you a king. I regret that I even made you a king. So he had Samuel go and anoint David to be the next king. Then he put David in Saul's house. And listen, Saul spent the next many years throwing spears trying to kill David. When Saul lost his anointing, he basically went totally wacko. You can read it in, in, in your Bible. It says his, his fingernails grew out like uh, that of a, a bird or an eagle. And, you know, he was just a mess. But I just kept thinking, it's funny that David, though he messed up, he never lost his anointing. What was the difference there? Saul began to throw spears at David. David never learned how to throw spears back at Saul. Let that sink in for a second. David never returned fire with fire. Saul became unbridled. He was anointed to be king. He had the anointing on him to speak to the nation. He had the anointing on him for warfare. He had the anointing on him to lead the armies. He had the anointing on him to entertain kings and queens of other lands. He, he, he was anointed by God, but he never allowed the anointing to carry over into his regular everyday living. David received the anointing, and David was a man of war. David had the anointing to lead the armies. David had the anointing to lead a nation. But David understood that the anointing was more, more than just leading armies. The anointing gave David the ability that even when he had the chance to kill Saul, which would have instantaneously put him on the throne, David said, I will not touch who God has anointed. David said, because the anointing is more than just me leading an army. It's the ability for me to see my adversary in front of me and still walk in the love and grace and forgiveness of God. The anointing will cause forgiveness to rise when all you want to do is bring out hatred and anger and bitterness. The anointing will cause you to shut your mouth. Man. Well, I've said we have to understand the anointing because we can be swayed as a church. We can see gifting and we can see popularity and we can, you know, see a great performance and a great show and get that confused with anointing. Amen. Some of us need to give up spear throwing. When somebody hurts us or somebody talks about us or somebody doesn't treat us right. The anointing gives us the ability to not return fire with fire, but entreat them instead of the way Jesus tells us to treat them. Well, that's hard, Pastor. Well, that's obedience. That's obedience. We don't like that word, obedience. I don't like obey in modern America. I'm my own person. I have my own right. Yeah and no. 
Because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, at some point you came to an altar somewhere and you said, not my life, but yours. For you to use, for you to choose to do, for you tell me, sir, where you would have me to go. I, I surrender and give my life to you. Which now means it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to him. Which means when he says go, I got to go. When he says stay quiet, I got to stay quiet. Obedience is what breaks that alabaster box. God is attracted to obedience. Do you know that? God is attracted to obedience. If you want to get God's attention, obey. Can you imagine what God could do with a group of people who just simply obeyed? I know I don't, I don't say that. Can, I have areas of my life that, you know, it's like, I know, I know. So I submit this. There is an anointing in us. The scripture says that we have an anointing. But I want to submit to us today also that the anointing might be restrained in its flow and in its effectiveness until we become more responsible to use it. It might be restrained until we become more responsible and learn how to use it. We may not have the fullness of God or the power of God in our lives the way that we want. And it's simply because the things that God was asking us to do, we weren't willing to do. You know, we like to over-spiritualize everything because it makes us feel better about ourselves. Well, God didn't call me to, you know, we think, well, yeah, he called somebody to be a missionary and go to Africa. And yeah, they should probably do that because he didn't call you to do that. But I'm not talking about becoming a missionary to Africa. I'm talking about your attitude. I'm talking about the bitterness that you still can't let go of because somebody hurt you. I'm talking about the way you see the world and other people as stepping stones to get what you want. I'm talking about the way you fight fire with fire. Somebody said it to you, they better embrace for what's coming. Come on. All right. So my question then is this. Are we waiting on God? Or is God waiting on us? I want 20 days of victory. Do you know what fasting is about? It's not a hunger strike against God. That God, I'm not going to eat this meal every day until you do something in my life. No, no, okay. Good luck. It's not what fasting's about. Because I understand that Christ already died on the cross and gave me everything that I needed. According to the scripture, I'm a joint heir with God. I have all that I need. The problem is there's something in me that's blocking me from experiencing victory in the area of my life that I need to experience. So fasting is really about learning to tell my flesh no for whatever that thing. It's supposed to be hard. I told our churches, I tell this pretty much every year we do our fast, but several years ago we were doing a fast and, you know, I like sugar a lot. And, you know, it was very difficult. And so I'm trying to do this, you know, lettuce, salad, you know, situation. And so I go into Panera Bread because they got salad and things like that. But the line just happened to curve right in front of that bakery section. <laughs> and it was fresh. And I found myself, and maybe you don't relate to this, but literally shaking, yep. looking at these bakeries. And they had the good Danish with all the, the cherry topping on top of it. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Preach with me. <laughs> it was good. And I realized I couldn't, if I stayed any, a moment longer in that environment, my fast would be out the window. Yep. So I literally had to just leave Panera. I couldn't even order. But, you know, as I'm sitting in the car thinking, Jim, what's wrong with you? Like, you can't even just, you know. What I learned was what fasting is really doing is it's teaching me how to live a sanctified life. Because when every ounce of my being once that sweetness, that taste, that thing that satisfies me. When I have the ability to turn and say no to that, I'm teaching myself that I can do that. 
that there's an anointing on me that will empower me to walk away. So the next time something comes across my television screen that I know I have no business watching, isn't it really the same situation? When somebody back, you know, says something bad about me and every ounce of my being wants to tell them what I really think about them and put them in their place, isn't it really the same situation? It's learning to control my flesh. So fasting isn't a hunger strike against God. It's saying, God, there's something out of alignment in me that's causing the anointing not to flow in its fullness in this area of my life. And therefore, it's limited. Remember, the anointing brings the favor of God. The anointing brings the presence of God. The anointing brings the blessing of God. So if an area of my life is limited without those things, it means that there's something holding back the flow. So fasting is saying, God, I'm bringing my mind and my body and my will under subjection for 20 days. I'm going to allow you to speak to me during these 20 days. What is it? Where is it? And maybe... Day 19, he tells you to go be a missionary in Africa. Well, glory to God. But maybe he says that person that you just can't stand. You, you can't even stand to think about them without your blood boiling. Maybe in this 20 days, you need to make a mental decision that I'm going to forgive that person as, as hard as it will be. Maybe God says, The gossip has to come out. The backstabbing has to come out. The addiction has to be laid down. I told you this before, but the power of the gospel isn't in words. The power of the gospel is in action. He didn't give us the Bible so we could read pretty words. He gave us the Bible so we could live it out in action, in deed. And that's where the power of the gospel is found. Not in our talking, but in our walking. So fasting is saying, God, unclog the dam. Show me the problem with me. If you're fasting to try to get the demon out of your husband or your wife or your kid or kids, then the whole thing's wrong. But God, in me, in me, as it is in heaven. Well, I don't know what God wants me to do. I haven't heard him say anything in the last five years. Well, what's the last thing he told you to do five years ago? If you haven't heard anything from then, then just keep doing what he told you to do and make sure you're doing it with fullness and with excellence. The book of Haggai, there's actually a story about uh, some people that God told them. He said, listen, I want you to rebuild the temple. And 18 years had gone by, and they were still busy building their own houses. And it's interesting because it says in Haggai that these people felt like that everything that they had was put into money bags with holes in it. Have you ever felt like that, that every time you get something, it just feels like the enemy can come in and steal it away, or it's just floating away, it's just gone? Sometimes it's because we're not doing what God's asking us to do. God said, build my house and then yours. And these people spent 18 years building their house and rejecting God's and then wondered why the blessing of God wasn't on them. Because they didn't do what he had asked them to do. And it makes perfect sense because to me, it's like, all right, well, let me build my house, God, so that I have somewhere to sleep. I, you know, all this is, for, and then once I'm settled, I'll get busy on your work. But, common sense. Like if you're stranded on an island, first thing, find some shelter, right? So, you know, it's not even, but it was the fact that God said obedience doesn't make sense to us most of the time. I believe if they would have built God's house first, he would, it wouldn't have taken them 18 years to build their own. Come on, when they were up on the wall, they they built the wall within 40 days, an incredible feat that was impossible. Why? Because they were obedient to what God had commanded them to do. So even sometimes when obedience doesn't make sense in our natural minds, what we're really doing is we're inviting the blessing and favor of God on our lives to make what would be 18 years to be in an instant. Sometimes we just need to ask God if we're doing what he's asking us to do. That's exactly what happened to Saul. 
Saul gave God a sacrifice, but God didn't want a sacrifice. He wanted obedience. Well, God, I won't be obedient, but I'll give you this. Well, that's not what God's into. God's not saying, give me what you want to give me. He's saying, I want you to do what I've asked you to do without. Here, listen to this. I want you to do it quickly and promptly without argument. Don't you wish your kids got that? <laughs> We're teaching our kids chores, so Jeremiah has some chores, and Judy's at the age where she's getting some chores. And one of her chores is, is to give the cat food in the morning and to give the dog food in, mor in the morning. Well, yesterday morning, she was throwing a temper tantrum. She didn't want to do it. And I'm like, all right, but then your allowance is gone. Choice is yours. So she was in there for like an hour doing it. Well, the cat was crying last night. I'm thinking, what's, what's going on? So I went in there. And she had filled up both bowls, food and water, with dog food, not cat. She knows the difference. It was more of a heart that says, I'll do it, but I'm going to do it my way because I don't want to do it at all. And it's like and it would be an amazing thing if kids could learn to just do it quickly, promptly, and without argument. Can I say the mark of a mature believer isn't how good you prophesy, isn't how well you sing, isn't how glorious you look and, uh, you know, the scriptures that you know and the Greek Hebrew words that doesn't mark a successful Christian. What marks a, success, a successful Christian is how quickly you can respond to God with a yes to his command. All right. Yes. Don't make sense. Yes. Give that away. Yes. Go there. Yes. Shut up and don't say it. Yes. Let vengeance be mine, says God. Okay. Come on, somebody. In Luke chapter 4, verse 14, it says this, and Jesus returned in the Power of the Spirit, I want you to pay attention to those words, power of the Spirit, meaning that the anointing of God was on him, uh, to Galilee, and a report went out throughout all the surrounding country. It's interesting what happened before Jesus' public ministry. He was baptized by John the Baptist, and the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, descended on him. And immediately after that, he was led out by the Spirit of God, it's important to know, into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days, 40 nights. And the Bible says he was tempted in every way that man can be tempted. After the temptation is where that verse of Scripture picks up. After the temptation, Jesus was led out of the wilderness and word about him spread throughout the land. Do you follow that? We want earthly ministry. We want to be known. We want a name. We want success. We want, you know, predominance. We want everyone to know who we are. We want to shine. Before any of that happened for Jesus, and what's interesting is Jesus didn't even have to do anything about it. Amen. He just walked out of the wilderness, and the scripture says word of him spread throughout the land. He didn't have to, you know, do a, have a PR scheme and send the disciples out and saying, here's what I need you to do. Start, you know, putting my name in some places, start rubbing some elbows, get me some speaking gigs. All he did was be obedient to the Holy Spirit. When he was led out into the wilderness, he did what he didn't want to do. Yeah. Tested for 40 days by the adversary. And once he passed the test, come on somebody. Once he passed the test, doors opened for him. He was let out. The Spirit of God was upon him. And suddenly his earthly ministry took off. What happens when we get led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God and we fail the test? We try to make it happen on our own strength. Scheme it to do it our own way. When he was tested by the enemy, he came out as pure gold. He came out full of the power of the Holy Ghost and he was able to do what God had called him to do. We cannot be full of the Holy Ghost anointing and power and do what we want to do 
It doesn't work that way. Power is connected to obedience. If you write anything down today, take that. Power is connected to obedience. The anointing is released when the alabaster box, the clay jar is broken. When we get rid of our self-centeredness. Lastly, for time's sake, I won't read the whole thing, but in Jonah chapter 1, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. Many of you know this story. It says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to speak against it for me because their sin has, has come up. And suddenly Jonah says, no, that's, that's not what's going to happen. I don't want to go to Nineveh. Your Bible says that Jonah runs the exact opposite direction from where God called him to go. But it's interesting because it says he also fled from the presence of the Lord when he did that. Now, can you ever really leave the presence of the Lord? No. David said, where could I go? I mean, can I go to the mountains? Can I go to the sea? Can I go to the... You're, You're there. So why would it say that he left the presence of the Lord when he ran? I believe he left the anointing. He left the anointing. He left the ability for God to flow and do specific things in his life because of his disobedience to the command of God. The Bible says that, listen, his life began to fall apart from that moment forward. It says he went down to Joppa. I think that's interesting that he went down instead of up. It says that he paid the price. How many of you know every time you run from the command of God, you go down and you pay a price? Come on. Not only that, if you know the story, he's swallowed by a fish. He spends three days in the belly of the whale. And finally, in Jonah chapter 2, he begins to say, All right, God, I am driven away from your sight, yet I look again to your holy temple. And he begins to say, Lord, lift my life out of this pit. He finally gets to a place where he says, Sorry, God, for the disobedience. And here's what I wanted you to see in Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Sometimes we don't need a breakthrough. We just need God to say it again. Let me submit this and hear my heart when I say it. Sometimes you don't need more prayer warriors around you laying hands on you. Because we like that. Let everybody around me, let them know my situation. Everybody and there's power in prayer. Don't miss it. understand what I'm saying. But them praying for breakthrough in your situation isn't going to help your situation if you're still in disobedience to God. So maybe we need less prayer warriors. Hold on. And we just need God to say it again and us to respond in obedience to the command of God. Sometimes we don't need, you know, to post vaguely on Facebook hey, everybody, pray for me, I'm going through something, which is like, okay. Yeah, attention, cry for help. What you need is God to say it again, and this time respond with a yes. Yes, I'll go. Yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll stop it. Yes, I'll be there. Yes, I'll give it up. Yes, I'll walk rightly. Yes, I'll open my Bible. Yes, I'll read the word. Yes, I'll spend time in prayer. Yes, I'll love my wife. Yes, I'll be faithful to my family. Yes, I'll be faithful to the house I got. Yes, 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 yes. And the more you give God, yes, you're opening the floodgates for the anointing to be present in your life and breakthrough to start flowing in your direction. Come on, somebody. But when you walk in disobedience and give God every reason under the sun why it doesn't make sense and it won't work and you can't do it that way, you are in rebellion against God. Does he love you? Absolutely. Does he have a wonderful plan for your life? Absolutely. The greatest thing, revelation I think I've ever gotten, is that the the will of God is not a guarantee. So we walk around and we read scriptures like Jeremiah 29, 11. His plans are good. They're going to prosper me. I'm going to be in health. All these wonderful things. But yet none of that is becoming a reality in our lives. Why? Because we think just because we read it, it's true. It's true, but it doesn't make it manifest. It only becomes manifested in our lives when we walk in obedience to the command of God. One thing we discovered this Wednesday night at the Bible study is that all of the commands of God or the blessings of God are if-end. 
If my people humble themselves and pray, then, if then. When we, we learn that even computer technology is built on this concept of if then. If this button is hit, then it does this. All the blessings of God call upon me, then I will answer. You can't find a promise that's not attached to an if then. But don't give me the if, just give me the then. Do my own thing, do my own way, live my own life, I'm my own person, I'm independent. Come on, this is America 2023. My will, my way, my right. And you are absolutely right. You can have your will, your way, your right. But don't expect the blessing of God to flow on your will, your way, and your right. It flows on his will, his way, and his right. Again, we, we, we shout when we say, well, God is no respecter of persons. If he did it for them, he will do it for you. Yes, but it doesn't mean he will. Because how they got it is by dramatic acts of obedience. By giving when they had nothing to give. Amen. Praying when they had no strength left to pray. By being obedient to his principles when every ounce of their beating said no. So now when we see it pressed down, shaken together, running over in their life, we like to sh stand up and shout and say, me too, God. Me too. And God says, no, not you too. Come on, this is a whole different me too movement. <laughs> it's you too. If you get the if then. Last scripture. And team, you can come a while. It's found in Ephesians 4, 29. Yeah. Ephesians 4, 29, it says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only... Such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Listen, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, among, you, uh, among with all malice." Disobedience affects the anointing on our lives. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? See, we like to run around and shout at culture because culture's not looking like the church. And well, that's sin. They shouldn't be doing that. He didn't say what the world does grieves the Holy Spirit. Corrupt talk. All bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, all things that grieve the Holy Spirit. All things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Man, church, if we get this, it will be an easy thing to not judge other people. I often told you the story when I was young, my dad was a drug addict, alcoholic, and my mom had begged him and begged him to come to church, and finally he decided to come to church, and after church, he went outside and sat in the car and lit up a cigarette, because what else does he do after church but smoke a cigarette? Some lady, God bless her, Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking lady comes out and sees my dad. <sighs> wow, well, that, that's not right. Went inside and told everybody. Told the pastors. And word got back. I think my dad ever stepped in foot into a church again? Not until weeks before he died. See, the Bible says he's building his house with living stones, which means all of us look different. There are things in your life that if I just surveyed your life, I would be like, well, that's obviously sin. And I could call you about it and write you a letter about it and pull you aside about it and do all those things. And things that you could look into my life and say, well, that's sin, because we all have a different struggle. But here's the thing I found about God. 
is God knows what he needs to work on and when he needs to work on it. So for something that he was all over you about, you assume, well, then you're going to judge everybody else with how God dealt with that thing with you. But you don't know that other person and what's going on in the rest of their world. So God might say, you know, yep, this area that you struggled with, yes, it's sin, but I'm not focused on that right now. I'm trying to deal with this thing in their life. So we run around and we try to fix everybody else's lives. But where does that leave us? Corrupt talk, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. Instead of realizing I'm accountable for what God puts his finger on in me. In me. And if we get this, I don't have time to judge where you're at. And to worry about, well, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't do it. I don't got time for that. Because as soon as I get an attitude problem, God's all over me. As soon as he, you know, the Holy Spirit told me to do something I didn't. All right, I got to clean up that mess because, sorry, God, I was in disobedience. How much more successful would we be as the church and as Christians if we realized the anointing was more than for the bang and the show and the shout? But it was the empowerment to obey, to be obedient to God. That's why this song was in my heart heavy today. Because when we say, God, I will give you all of my worship. I'll give you all my praise. What I'm saying is, I'll give you my yes. You have it. So let's stand. Father, we are so grateful today that we have an anointing that you've given the Holy Spirit to us to empower us to move forward in life to break the gates of brass and the bars of iron to make the crooked path straight we give you praise for that we, we thank you that we have an anointing to open blind eyes and pray for the sick and see them recover we thank you for that But today, Father, we make it more personal. Today, Father, we say we thank you that we have an anointing to be obedient. That my yes has an anointing on it. That my act of obedience will open doors. The act of obedience will cause things to happen in my life that I couldn't do on my own. So despite it all, Father, would you speak to me again? If I've, if I've gone astray, Father, would you help us? Would you be like to us like you were with Jonah? And may the word of the Lord come to us again. Would you give us a second chance and a second opportunity to make it right and this time say yes? To this time forgive, this time shut our mouths, this time to go where you've told us to go. That when we sing these words, I give you all of my worship. It's not just about a song and the raising of our hands, but it's about a condition of our heart being obedient as a response to the request and the command of God. May the word of the Lord come to us again. Come on. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise you alone i long to worship you alone how worthy of my praise i will give you all my worship i will give you all my praise you alone I long to worship you alone come on let's lift it up to him this morning come on I'll give you I will give you all my word I'll give you my yes God I will give I'll give you my obedience father because you alone you alone 
I long to worship you alone. Come on. How worthy of my praise. I will give you all my worship. And I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone, how worthy of my praise. So just right now in this moment, just ask the Father, is there anywhere I've gone off? Have there been problems? Situations I've said no. Said what I shouldn't say. Do what I shouldn't have done. Father, let the word come to us again. And this time, this time, we'll say yes. We'll say yes. We're say yes. Will you say yes to him, church? Aren't you grateful that even when we've messed it up, he says, I'll send my word a second time. That overwhelms me. It overwhelms me. In my understanding, I'd say if you messed it up, too bad on you. I'll send my word a second time. Thank you, Father. Well, we're going to let this team lead us in a song of worship, and Pastor Travis is going to come and close the service, and we have a testimony to share with you. So we're going to move on in the service, but I just encourage you, even as we're Moving on in the service, just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. God, over the next 20 days, speak to us. Speak to us during this fast. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen.